Yeah. Question. Yeah, but between 50 to 60 minutes is fine. All right, I'll answer that then. All right, so yeah, so this talk's gonna be in some recent progress I've made in the quantum subgroup classification. All right, and I'm gonna give a fairly high level overview of my results. And if you kind of follow along and see some of the finer arguments, then I have this paper which has recently appeared on the archive. And this is the part one. This deals with the non-heterotic case and then part two will be coming soon. And this will be the non-heterotic case. All right. And so I'm speaking in the mathematical physics and physical mathematics seminar. And my work is more of the mathematical mathematics. All right, but I'll try to motivate that back to mathematical physics in some sense. But for the most part, my language will be very mathematical. All right, so let's just give an overview of what I've done before I get into the, the finer details. All right, and like I said, the idea is just we're looking at these quantum subgroups of the simple Lie algebras. And for this case, we're just focusing on type A. And this is for a few reasons. I mean, the main one is just historically SLN has had the most interest from the physics community and from the math community. Right. Also for these type two quantum subgroups, you actually expect to find the most interesting stuff for SLN. And this just because of the existence of the E7 quantum subgroup of SL2. All right, and where for the other simple Lie algebras, at least for the classical ones, there's kind of much less combinatorial evidence for the existence of exceptional type two quantum subgroups. Right, so for this reason, I'm gonna focus on SLN, but I expect that my arguments are actually general enough that they can be altered to work for any classical Lie algebra. Though this is, not written down, I haven't really worked the details. It'll be like a nice PhD project if anyone's interested in extending this to simple Lie, uh, classical simple Lie algebras. All right, so I'm gonna give classification and in fact, it's gonna be such a broad classification that's gonna get all these type two quantum subgroups for all n less than seven. And well, I mean, above seven, it's not really known, but it's suspected that these are gonna give all of them for all of the ends, but I can't say anything concrete past seven. Okay, and so what's the big result? Well, we find a family of exceptionals. And so this kind of generalizes the seven quantum subgroup of SL2. And it turns out this actually lives in a family. So of course, E7 is SL2 at level 16. Then you get one at SL3, level nine, SL4, level eight, and then SL5, level five. And in fact, this is actually a little bigger. There's level rank jewels, and this card then runs in reverse. We swap the level on the rank until you get the SL16 at level two, and then the family just dies off, which I found very surprising. Like this only holds for small rank. And then after that, there's really just nothing in terms of these exceptional type twos. All right, and that's kind of like the most interesting thing about this result. All right, so this is the overview. Let me now get into some of the finer details. All right, so let's just start with the problem. Like, what is a quantum subgroup of, in general, a simple Lie algebra, but for us, SLN? And we can phase this in a bunch of different ways. The way I tend to think about it is the mathematical mathematics perspective, which is done through representation theory and really just category theory. And the idea here is you look at this category of level K integral representations of affine SLN. And here K we take to be a positive integer level. And what you wanna do is you just wanna classify the module categories over these braided tensor categories. And we just define a quantum subgroup to be precisely one of these module categories. 
So in this sense, we can think of these quantum subgroups as being like a higher representation theory of SLM. All right. And like representation theory of anything, the idea is can we classify the representations? Can we find interesting ones? Can we find exotic ones? And so on. But really, we're interested in classification. All right. And so again, this is the mathematics physics and physical mathematics seminar so I should give some physical justification as well and so in terms of conformal field theory we can construct the chiral wz w models which just take input g a simple e algebra and k which for us again will just be a positive integer and the question here is well can we construct a full conformal field theory which kind of joins a WZW Cara model. So in some sense, like an extension of the conformal field theory. And so here, this is equivalent to one of these module categories over this quantum group category. All right, so this quantum subgroup problem naturally appears in conformal field theory as well. And then finally, we have one from physical mathematics, which for me I've taken to mean operator algebras. And here the problem of classifying quantum subgroups for SLN is precisely the problem of classifying a subfactor, uh, in this case of a hyperfinite type 2, 1. And we want the even bimodule of that subfactor to be equivalent to the level K into a representations of. SLM. Right, so we have three problems here, which are all roughly the same thing. So I'm hoping this is kind of interesting to a broad range of people in the audience. But like I said, I'm going to focus mainly on the language of category theory and, well, the representations of quantum SLM. But I'll try and introduce some CFT stuff as well. Though I'm not an expert on the CFT stuff by any means, so forgive me if I say something that's not quite precise here. All right, and so just to really get that kind of connection between CFT and the categorics, I just kind of want to explain the connection just a little more. So here we have our WZW model. All right, and again, this takes input a Lie algebra G and an integer k, and it gives us our, uh, in this sense, uh, vertex operator algebra, and this is going to be rational. All right, and this means that the representation theory is just going to be a modular tensor category, and for the cases we care about, this is exactly our uh, quantum group category g sub k. And now the physicists and the mathematics people tend to think about this slightly differently. And really this comes down to a difference of combinatorics versus categorics. And so the way the physicists tend to think about this, at least from what I've gathered, is that where you can take your WZW model or really any rational VOA and you can get your predictive representation of SL2Z. And then if you have a full CFT extending this theory, then you can extract a partition function or modular invariant matrix, which is just a positive integer value matrix, which commutes with this projective representation of SL2C. And this is what I call the combinatorics of the problem. Because really it is just an integer matrix. Like they're hard to find, but there's nothing really intrinsically categoric about this. Right. But now from the mathematics side of things, we now look at our quantum group category. And like we said, a quantum subgroup for us is just a module category. So a semi-simple category on which our category X. And this is actually more data than just the modular invariant. So if you want to extract the modular invariant from this module category, you can look at alpha induction just by taking the overbraidings and the underbraidings and mapping into the dual even part. And then from this, you can extract your 
modulum variant. But you can't go the other way. And in fact, there are examples of modular invariants which are not realized by module categories. And this is because you need more data. You need what are called the 6J symbols, which are essentially just a way to reshuffle your trivalent vertices in your module category. And this involves specifying a whole bunch of complex numbers and these have to satisfy the Pentagon axiom, which is a nasty, nasty, I guess it's degree three polynomial system of equations. And so these six J symbols are what I refer to as the categorics of the problem. And so to get the module category or the quantum subgroup completely, you need the module invariant, the commutorics, and then the six J symbols, which is the categorics. And in terms of difficulty, this is what makes the problem very hard. It's not too hard to write down a modular invariant. It's really hard to take that modular invariant and write down a coherent system of six J symbols for it. And in fact, I've tried this. And it really made me question my ability as a mathematician. Oh, sorry. Was that a question? I don't think so. Right. I think I heard something from my other computer. That is my fault. Um, yeah, so like I said, in this uh, my work, I find some candidates for exceptional type two modular invariants. I tried to write down the six J symbols. I just couldn't do it. The systems are so obscene. You get 1700 variables. These are all complex values. There's 20,000 equations. Like explicitly solving for these categorics is near impossible for the larger examples. I've seen it done for the E7 example. And in fact, the SU SL3 example at level nine, this is actually David Evans and Matthew Pugh. But beyond this, it just gets obscene. So we need to find smart ways to deal with the categorical side of the problem. And that's going to be kind of what this talk is about. All right, so let's look at an example now to bring this down to earth. And so let's just pick one of the simplest ones. We'll take SL3 and our level is gonna be six. So what's our category look like? Well, our simple objects, we just take the fundamental veil chamber of SL3. And the six, the level just means we take a cut. So level six just means you cut six along and then you kill all the objects to the right of that. And what this does is it takes, well, the classical representation theory of SL3, which is a well, an infinite semi-simple tensor category and it quotients this out. So you're left with a, a tensor category of a finite number of simple objects. So a fusion category, and in this case, actually even a modular tensor category. And you can see this generalizes to arbitrary Lie algebras G and integer level K. You just take that fundamental veil chamber and then truncate according to K. And so the objects in this category, super nice. What becomes hard are the morphisms. These get really complicated after you take that semi-simple uh, yeah, semi quotient to kill off these objects. And so for this SL3, these are described by Kuperberg spiders, which is just a system of trivalent vertices. And so these satisfy some local relations. And then if you only looked at the endomorphism spaces, you can also define these morphisms by the Hecker algebras. Um, so you can describe them, but they're complicated. And these only give you like small slices of the morphisms. So really we don't have like as much information about these categories as we like. And this is what makes the problem hard. If we have this explicit information, then we can answer any question we want about these categories, but we don't have that. So we have to find essentially tricks and smart techniques to work with these things. All right. And because this talk is about quantum subgroups, we have one non-trivial quantum subgroup or module category of this SL3 at level six. And this one is kind of boring. It's a 
simple current module category. And what do you do? Well, you just take the simple currents or the invertible objects in your tensor category. And you can essentially quotient out by these. So these are all going to collapse down to a single object. And essentially, it cuts your fundamental veil chamber into three. And you just take a representative of each orbit, except for that single point, which is fixed. And due to the categorical nature of these things, this splits into three new objects. And so what we're left with is this. And this is the graph for tensoring by the fundamental representation, which is included here. All right, so that's a concrete example. And in fact, these simple current quantum subgroups are going to pop up again. So keep this in mind. These are a very general source of quantum subgroups. And in fact, in some sense, they're all of them. All right, so let's look at the history of this problem, the quantum sub problem. And this has been attacked by many different communities. Because like I described before, this problem is very intertwined with different areas of mathematics. And everyone wants to understand it from their point of view. And so this is originally attacked by the conformal field theory community. But like I said, they are more interested in the combinatorics of the problem. And so what they really um, classified were these modular invariants or the partition functions of the theory. So their first result occurred for SL2, like the simplest Lie algebra. Of course, that's the natural place to start. And this is back in 86 here. So this is by Capelli, Bixikin, and Zabur. And essentially what they did was they just brute force classified all the modular invariants of SL2. And you can do this because it's really just a commutatoric problem at hand. They can write down a basis for a solution space and then start imposing restrictions on that basis. And they arrived at their classification. And the cool thing was that this classification was very interesting. It had the stuff you expected, the trivial modules, the simple current modules, but it also had exceptions. And that's what got people really interested in this problem. There's non-trivial stuff going on here. If it was just the trivial stuff, then it would probably just answer the story. But what they found, and I'll get to this in a sec, was three exceptionals. And whenever you have exceptional stuff popping up, it means there's interesting mathematics going on. And the fact they just kind of brute force found these means that we're missing some of the finer mathematics going on. And so the quest is now on. Like, how can we extend this and can we really understand this quantum subgroup problem from a, I guess, a more, what's the word? A better perspective. So this now continues. There's a bit of a gap here because these brute force techniques, they just don't work for the higher Lie algebras. But Terry Gannon, he came along. I believe this was a PhD thesis, actually. And he managed to take a Galois theory spin to it. And he found some very strong Galois symmetries in these modular invariants. And it turns out this was you know, a pretty good break. It was enough to have extend these results from SL2 up to SL3. And so he was able to give the modular invariance for the SL3 quantum subgroups. All right. But like I said earlier, this is just the commutatorics. We also need these six J symbols, the categorics of the situation. All right. And this is where some of the other communities come into play. And so in slightly different language, this is the sub factor community, the SL2 Categorics were figured out in the early 90s as part of the low index sub vector classification. And this is also put Victor Ostrich in here in 03, I believe, who worked this out explicitly in the categorical language. All right. And so this result here, this finishes off SL2. We now have rigorous classification of these SL2 quantum subgroups. We have the commutatorics, we have the categorics. And so naturally, you now look at SL3, 
and you want the same thing. What are the categorics here? And this is worked out by David Evans and Matthew Pugh, both at uh, Cardiff, I believe. And they managed to solve the 6J symbols for these modular invariants. And this was in 2009. All right. And then I'm also going to point out a result of Adrian Bocniano. And so in a paper of his, he has claimed SL4 classification. But there is no proof given, and there was no explicit 6J symbols or anything like that. So I think the best we can say here is claimed. Right. So the rigorous point of view, essentially what we have now is SL2 classification and then SL3 classification. And then also an idea of what should happen at SL4 because everyone believes it's solved. It's just, we don't really have the rigorous proof to justify it. Right, so let me now focus more on this SL2. Let me show why it's so interesting. And the reason it's interesting is like I said, we have exceptional examples. So let's start with the non-exceptionals. Essentially we have these ANs, which are the trivial quantum subgroups. And then we have our D2Ns and our D2Ns plus ones. And these are our simple currents. And these actually kind of change flavor depending on the parity of n. And this is due to a phenomenon known as type two quantum subgroups, uh, type one quantum subgroups versus type two quantum subgroups. And this is a very fundamental bifurcation in this problem. We need these two things behave very, very differently. In fact, this talk is to be focused entirely on the type two classification. But this is the reasons I'll explain in a sec. Right. But yeah, so essentially this top half is kind of boring. These are things we know exist. And the fact that apparently classification is really of no interest to anyone. What really got people excited were these exceptional examples. We have E6, which occurs at uh, no, no, no. k equal 10. We have E8, which occurs at k is equal to 28. And then E7, which is type 2, which occurs at k is equal to 16. And so these, well, these are exceptional in the back in 86. So now it's kind of understood that they occur for a, a fairly, what's the word? Uh, well understood reason. And the idea behind this is these correspond to conformal inclusions of loop groups. And I'll explain more about this in a sec. But essentially, this gives a, a very fundamental way to construct type one quantum subgroups based on stuff from conformal field theory. And so these are kind of semi-exceptional in the modern point of view. Right. And so this leaves us with E7. And I believe this fully determined, uh, what's the word, fully deserves the term exceptional. Though I will give a very interesting construction of E7 in just a bit. All right, so let me talk more about this type one versus type two split. So type one is, you can describe it in a bunch of ways. So if you care about CFT, then if you have your CFT encoded as a, a chiral CFT encoded as a vertex operator algebra, then these type one quantum subgroups just correspond to extensions of the vertex operator algebra. All right. And the categorical point of view, this just means that our module category has the additional structure of a tensor category. So beyond being acted on by the category of level K integral electrontations of SLM, we can also self use these module representations. And the reason for this kind of comes back to this conformal field theory, really. Uh, 
fishy. Don't worry about that. All right. And if you care about the sub factor point of view, which is really about algebra objects and unitary tensor categories, then you can characterize this type oneness by saying that, well, there's going to be an object in this module category which corresponds to the tensor unit. When you take internal endomorphisms of that, of that object tensor unit, you get an algebra. And if this algebra is commutative, then we know we're in the type one land. Right. And then type two is just by definition, for me anyway, just everything else that's not covered by these equivalent conditions. All right. And so there's a bifurcation going on here. The classification results that work for type one do not work for type two and vice versa. So really we're looking at two separate problems here. All right, and so we really do have to split. All right, and so it turns out in type one, there's been some, some huge, huge progress made. And this has been done by Terry Gannon. And so the history page I showed earlier actually wasn't complete. And so it did show the gap where not much had been made, but this has changed very recently with work of Terry Gannon. And this actually builds on work of Andrew Chopre from back in 2017. And what Andrew showed was that when you look at these type one quantum subgroups for the rank two Lie algebras, there's actually a level bound where exceptionals can occur. And as soon as you have this level bound, you can then pick one of those Lie algebras and then just go and search up to that level and see what you find. And because we know the level bound, well, then we know we've found every single exceptional if it pops up in that search. So if level bounds, it reduces to essentially computer search. Right. And so Gannon, he took these results of Andrew Chopre and he extended these level bounds all the way up to every simple E algebra, I believe. And this is just by mixing in his Galois theory arguments he had for SL3 back in the 90s. And his bounds were effective, was the other thing. And so this allowed him to actually give classification for all ranks less than or equal to six, which is huge. Like we spent the past 30 years just knowing SL2 and SL3. And now Terry's come along. He now has completed type one for all the algebras less than six. I don't even know how many Lie algebras it is, but easily more than 10, I believe. But yeah, it's a huge, huge improvement on the state of affairs. And because he has level bounds for all of his algebras, essentially the six just occurs due to computing power now. I mean, you do have to categorically construct the exotic things you find, but I mean, Terry's not doing this. And so the six really isn't like a hard bound. I'm sure researchers could throw their heads at this and push this higher and higher. The takeaway here is that type one, has really been knocked out of the park. This is, for the most part, fully classified. And so what does he find? Well, you get the expected things. You get your simple currents. And these are essentially just the equivariantizations by a abelian subcategory. So a copy of rep z to the r, where, well, it's a little complicated. r has to divide n, and r squared has to divide n times k. But it's nothing crazy. These are fully classified. Then you get these conformal inclusions. All right. And these occur from loop groups. And it's when you have G at level K embedded inside H at level one. And this is actually the reason why E6 and E8 occur, like I explained earlier. Right. And then the really interesting stuff about Terry's work was he found like truly exceptional examples, which is things that just don't exist for any good reason. And this is how you know you're dealing with interesting mathematics. And that means there's something very deep going on here we haven't understood. And so these do exist. Anyway, this is Terry's work. I'm not going to dwell on this for too much. The takeaway here is that type one is, for the most part, settled. 
And so now we have to look at type two. And so how do we make any progress here? And so for this, we can take some inspiration from the physicists. And so if you look in a paper of Moore and Cyberg, they have this quote here, which says up to a maximal extension of the Carroll algebra, the modular invariant is a permutation matrix. All right, so that's useful. We have to turn it into mathematics to actually use this and get categorical information. And so this was done by Davidov, Nietzsche, and Ostrich. I think this was in 2013. All right. And they realized this permutation matrix should be some sort of braided equivalence of a modular category. And so they show a bijection between module categories over an arbitrary modular tensor category. And so remember, module categories for us are our quantum subgroups, both type one and type two. So this will include this. And then the data of this permutation. And so what's this permutation? Well, it's going to be a braided equivalence. And it's going to be between two type one quantum subgroups. And what you do is you take their ambichiral parts. And this is a little complicated to write down the precise definition of, especially in a talk like this. But you can just think of it as being like the largest braided subcategory of the quantum subgroup. Or if you care about the vertex operator algebra perspective, uh, the type one quantum subgroup is going to correspond to an extension. And the ambichiral part is just the representations of that extension. So yeah, the takeaway is that these, all these quantum subgroups can be described by a triple of data, two type one quantum subgroups, and then a braided equivalence between their ambichiral parts. Right, and so this lays out the goal for how we get these type two quantum subgroups. You just fix any pair of type one quantum subgroups, which are now classified up to high rank, and you want to determine all the braided equivalences between their ambicara parts. And again, we get another little uh, purification. We get the heterotic examples and the non-heterotic examples. And this just means, well, are these two type one quantum subgroups are different or the same? If they're different, there's very, very few examples. And these we dealt with in part two of my work, which is going to appear hopefully during the summer. And so where we get the most interesting stuff is the non-heterotic case, which is where our type two quantum subgroups are the same. And these are the vast majority of these type two quantum subgroups. All right, so let's look at the non-heterotic case. And so from Terry Gannon's work, we have three kinds of type we have the exceptionals, which have the most interesting type one quantum subgroups. Except here we get some weird stuff. It turns out the ambichiral parts for these type ones are very boring. And so essentially there's nothing interesting you can do here to build equivalences between these. So here there's no interesting type two, no interesting non-heterotic type two behavior. Then we have our conformal inclusions of the lead groups. And it's known that if you have a conformal inclusion of this form, it's gonna give you a type one quantum subgroup and its ambichiral part will just be the level one integral representations of the Lie algebra associated to H. And these categories are for the most part, pretty easy to work with. And so, the equivalences between these have been dealt with in one of my earlier papers that was released in 2020. And so that leaves the simple currents. And this is where you get the kind of paradoxical behavior. It turns out for the simple currents, you get the most interesting and the chiral parts. And so it's here that you expect to find 
the most interesting type two quantum subgroups. And in fact, they have to occur here because they can't occur here, they can't occur here. The only place they could possibly occur is when you're looking at pairs of simple currents. So let's look at an example of one of these. Let's go back to the SL3 at level six example. And so our category just looks like this. It's our fundamental veil chamber, which has been truncated at level six. Now we quotient out by Z mod three, and that gives us these representatives for our simple objects. And then to take the antichiral part, essentially you just take the zero graded pieces with respect to the canonical Z mod three grading, and you're left with a category with six simple objects. And the question is just to understand the symmetry behind these things. And for this example, we just get what I call the generic symmetry. So we have Z mod three acting just by permuting these three objects. And this just comes from the de-equivariantization by you know, Z mod three. Right. And then you can also swap this object and this object and this corresponds to charge conjugation of the initial category. And so together, these give us a dihedral group worth of symmetry. And this dihedral group is what we'll call generic. And so what you're interested in is non-generic stuff, because generic stuff gives us boring type two quantum subgroups. We want non-generic behavior. And so how, well, the goal is now, can we classify equivalences of all these things? And more interestingly, can we find non-generic stuff? And so that's the main result of my first paper. So this was released on the archive last month, and it precisely answers this question. We look at these ambicaro parts of the simple currents, and we can show that they all have a generic behavior with regard to the symmetries, apart from four examples, up to level range relative. So if the result was just this, it would be boring. It would just say there's nothing interesting out there. There's no exciting type two quantum subgroups. And that would be a terrible thing. Well, not a terrible theorem, but a dull theorem. But what I like about this quantum subgroup stuff is there's always interesting stuff going on. And I find four cases where we have interesting equivalences between these categories, and in fact, order equivalences. And this means we have four cases up to level range reality where we have interesting type two quantum subgroups. We get SL2 level 16, which recall is just E7. We have SL3 at level nine, and this was one constructed by Evans and Pugh in 09. We get SL4 at level eight. This was claimed by Ognianu, but there was no proof here. And then we have SL5 at SL5. And this has actually been seen before in work of Zhu and Pinhas Grossman and the subfactor language. But I believe there is no connection drawn to the quantum subgroup problem in most papers. But correct me if I'm wrong there. All right, and so the corollary of this is that this actually finishes the type two quantum subgroup classification for all in less than seven. Using that theorem above, we take two pairs of type one quantum subgroups and classify as equivalences between the Ambicaro parts. With this theorem, we can now work through that and complete the entire classification. And this will be dealt with in part two of my paper, which again has not been released yet. So this one isn't really a theorem yet, but it will be coming soon. And it's a direct consequence of this theorem. All right, so let me in the last 10 minutes explain my techniques. And it boils down to two parts. Essentially you have, well, you want to, deal with all those generic cases and show there's only a finite number of cases where you can have interesting behavior. And this is what I call reduction. And I don't want to say 
too much on this because it's extremely technical. It really is the, the heart of the paper and where a lot of the hard work is done, but going into detail on here is just not very enlightening, I believe. Essentially, you use Lee theory combinatorics to get some number theory style bounds that give you strong restrictions on how the objects can move under one of these equivalences. And essentially using this Lee theory combinatorics, you can use some number theory style arguments to show that the adjoint representation must be fixed. All right. Then once you have this fact, you can then move to a planar algebra style argument. You can build a planar algebra, which is built from endomorphisms of powers of that adjoint representation. And this is going to be generated by two trivalent vertices. And then also a new generator, which I call S, that has a bunch more links. And this S kind of encodes taking the deequivariantization. Right. And so you can give an explicit presentation of that planar algebra. And with that, you can fully understand the symmetries that fix that adjoint representation. They appear as planar algebra automorphisms. And this allows you to deduce that essentially, except for a finite number of cases, which are very explicit. It gives you essentially exactly the cases where these things do occur that you have generic behavior. All right. So yeah, I don't want to say too much on that, but that's the rough idea of how that proof goes. And so once you've done this analysis, this technical analysis, then you're left with, I believe it was nine cases. Well, essentially, up to the point of five cases where there could be an exceptional braided order equivalent. And so one of these, you can just, well, look at the fusion ring of the category. It's um, SL4 level 8 mod rep Z mod 2. And you can see that it just can't exist. Just at the combinatorial level, there's nothing there. And so this leaves us with four now. And these are the four that uh, actually exist and are in the statement of the proof. You have SL2, level 16, SL4, level 8, SL3, level 9, SL5, level 5. And the fun part of the theorem is the existence of these things. We now have all the combinatorical data to know these things exist, but we need the category. It's like I said, you could just write down six J symbols. It's possible there, it's possible there. Again, that was done by Evans and Hugh. But I tried it for this one and it's just impossible. Well, not impossible, but extremely difficult. You get some crazy equations. So you need you know, enlightened methods on how to construct these things. And I found some very weird stuff. Essentially, there's two things you should never see together. Triality of SO8 and then quadratic categories. Why on earth are these things appearing? Triality of SO8, I mean, not so surprising we're dealing with Lie algebras. Quadratic categories, I don't know. They're just there. And this is, again, makes it interesting mathematics. There's things going on we really don't understand so well. And again, I draw this Venn diagram because this SL4 at level eight actually fits into both camps. You could construct it using the quadratic category argument, or you could construct it using a triality argument. And in fact, if anyone saw this paper when it was first put out, I had this one purely in this camp here. And it was actually a open question because the quadratic category was super nasty. And so I want to thank Victor Ostrich, who actually told me that you could use trality of SO, SO8 to bring it back into this camp. And that gives a much more elegant construction and allows us to construct this braided equivalence here. All right, so let's explain these two things. So first of all, how does trality of SO8 occur? Well, it occurs to two, SL2 at level 16 and SL4 at level eight. And it's both roughly the same. 
SL2 at level 16 is related to SO3 at level eight. And then a level rank duality gives that this is connected to SLA, SO8 at level three. And now triality will act with an order three order equivalence on this. And you can pull it back through these connections to get a order three symmetry on the Ambikara part of the simple current extension. All right, again, these connections aren't precise, but you can make them precise. And the same thing works for SL4 at level H. SL4, just by a coincidence of the Dinkin diagrams, is SO6. And then again, you use level range duality. I mean, most of the problem here is just formalizing this level range duality. But you can find this in my paper. You can connect this to SO8 at level six. And again, triality X on the order three automorphism, you can bring this back and you can construct your symmetry of the ambichiral part. And now the one I think most is most interesting is the connection to quadratic categories. And so recall we had these three examples. And when I first did this kind of technical analysis and came up with these, and I was wondering if they existed, the first thing I did was, well, I looked at their dimension. So it's like the roughest invariant you can get. And all of them are defined over quadratic fields. And this is not generic in the slightest. And so I thought, well, where else do you see quadratic fields for the dimensions precisely in quadratic categories? And so once you have that data, you can make a kind of guess that these categories should live inside Trimfeld centers of very explicit quadratic categories. And you can make this precise through bit equivalence. And so we can construct quadratic categories where these quantum group categories we're interested in live inside the Drimfeld centers. Right. And for us, this is amazing because Masaki Izumi has a Kuntz algebra method. And using this Kuntz algebra method, he's been able to explicitly construct these quadratic categories. This one, not done. But remember, we constructed this one a different way. And so, what's well, a very happy coincidence is that Izumi's work actually finishes our theorem off. The Kuntz algebra method actually gives essentially the most explicit possible construction of this and this. Essentially, you have all the 6J symbols at hand. And as soon as you have the 6J symbols, you completely understand the category, and you essentially completely understand the Drinfeld center. And because of that, you can understand its braided symmetries, and living inside of there, we have the things we're actually interested about. And so using this quadratic category connection, we can build our exotic symmetries on these categories. Right. And that's the end of the existence. We get two by trality, and then we get the remaining two by quadratic categories. And I guess the rest by level rank duality. Right. And so that's the theorem, and that's the result. And so just to summarize, we now know symmetries of all known type one quantum subgroups for SLN. And in particular, this includes all type one subgroups for N less than or equal to seven. And so then via that more cyber argument, we then get all type two quantum subgroups for N less than seven. And so when paired with Gannon's result, this finishes all quantum subgroups groups for these n less than seven. Right, and then thinking towards the future, if now we want to look at n bigger than eight, then this theorem of mine actually puts us in a good point to finish off that classification. Because now it essentially relies on the type one classification. Because now we know all the symmetries of the simple currents, all you have to do when that type one classification gets extended is study the symmetries of the exceptional things you find. And that's just going to be like a single example here and there. 
And based on, well, the prior examples we've seen, their ambicarol parts should be fairly trivial. And so all you have to do is a few computations once the type one classification has been completed to bump it up to type two classification. All right, I think that's 15 minutes, so I'll end my talk there. So let me start.